folks who are running late tonight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, Royal Astronomical Society's uh, um, geez, take two. <laughs> evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Ontario Science Centre and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Toronto Centre. My name is Tom Luton. I'll be your host for the evening. 
Uh, tonight we've got three presentations. Uh, unfortunately, we're down to two because of technical problems. Uh, Richard Blackman's presentation on focusing is going to have to be rescheduled for reasons our laptop does not seem to like it very much. So um, we're going to start off with Brian Cernick's Sky This Month, the uh, Mother's Day edition, and then Elizabeth Tasker will be talking about uh, her book look, on the planet on the alien skies. Um, before we begin, is there anyone here for the first time? Welcome. <laughs> All right. So to get things started, Brian with the sky this month. Okay. Whoa. Uh, someone's cell phone. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, the coming month, we have Mother's Day on the uh, 12th. So I thought I'd pick a theme and uh, talk about all things related to mothers and Mother's Day in the night sky. Um, let me just say a few words about this uh, um, photo. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had the good fortune to go one one of my favorite places in the uh, south, uh, south uh, Arizona where Arizona has lots and lots of observatories. There's Flagstaff, there's Kitt Peak that you can visit. There's the fantastic, uh, perfect meteor crater. Lots of meteorite vendors live in that area. Good telescope stores and nice dark skies like this here. And if you go in March and April, you can see Omega Centauri rising around midnight in those two months just from your doorstep. It's quite wonderful. So um, I've nicknamed the area the Mecca for astronomy in mainland America, or <laughs> Mama. <laughs> so let me begin by talking about uh, Luna. Luna was, or Selene, uh, in Greek, was the Titan goddess who drove her two-horse chariot across the night sky to visit her uh, lover, uh, Endymion, while her brother, Saul, or Helios, rested with his four-horse chariot that he drove across the daytime sky. So here we have, whoops, Mother's Day on the 12th down there, which is just after Astronomy Day on the 11th. So probably no late night imaging or you won't be uh, up to speed for Mother's Day. Um, and we just passed Earth Day, so it's a big month here. We have uh, the first couple of weeks, we have pretty good time for observing because the moon is not full. The moon is not full till the 18th, the week after Mother's Day. It happens to be the flower moon, uh, also called the corn planting moon or milk moon. Um, not sure how you pronounce this in Inuit, but it means the time when ducks and geese return from south because there aren't too many flowers in the Arctic. Um, each Native, um, native culture has their own names and if you want to look further, there's some interesting names for the different moons. It, um, in the southern hemisphere, it would be, of course, fall, so it's the hunter's moon. And you'll notice that uh, the moon's closest approach to us is about a week earlier, so clearly, the moon won't be within 10% of its maximum size for the month, which is the definition of a supermoon. Those we had uh, earlier in March, and we won't have another supermoon until the three, two in August and one in September, except those aren't full moons, they're new moons. So that's one thing I want to point out. The blue moon, this is also a blue moon, and blue moons come every one to two years, every two to three years. 
And a blue moon means that we've got um, four full moons between the equinox, like the March equinox, and the solstice. And the blue moon is the third moon. So this is the third uh, moon in uh, that period or astronomical season. Um, I would have put a blue flower in here, but blue is a rare shade in uh, plants and flowers and animals. Uh, so they don't actually have a true blue pigment, so I settled for a, a red rose. Um, if we look at Saul and what Saul is doing for us, Saul is cutting down our nighttime observing by an hour and a half over this month period. So sunrise, sunset are about 6.30, quarter after 8 right now, and that changes by a half hour in the uh, sunset and uh, sunrise uh, much earlier as well. So we're starting to lose that nighttime observing as we get closer to uh, um, mid-June. So let's carry on with the theme of mothers in the solar system. And the obvious mother in the solar system is Earth or Gaia. But let's see what other ones we have. Aphrodite is the only other planet named after uh, a woman. Uh, if we look a little further, we go to the astro uh, asteroid belt, and there's actually quite a few asteroids named after uh, mothers. Juno, uh, I'll single out, because Juno was Jupiter's uh, uh, wife, and Jupiter was a bit of a ladies' man, so it's just as well that she's separated from Jupiter in the asteroid belt. Now, Jupiter, uh, if any of you uh, entered that contest that Carnegie Science had, uh, it closed on April 15th. It was to name five of the 12 new moons that were discovered for Jupiter. Uh, you would have learned that all of Jupiter's moons have to be named after either Jupiter's descendants or his lovers. So I've listed a few. I didn't want to go through all 79. Uh, and you notice interesting ones here, like Europa led to the name for Europe. Callisto, I didn't know, appears in the night sky twice, once as a moon of Jupiter, and another time as the constellation Ursa Major. And uh, Leda, a rather tiny uh, moon of Jupiter uh, was the mother of Castor and Pollux in Gemini. If we go to Saturn, there's a similar thread. A lot of the moons are named after uh, mothers. Uh, in particular here, we've got Dion, who is a Titan giant uh, goddess that was the mother of Venus, our other uh, male, uh, female uh, planet. Now, let's talk about all the planets, or as the Greeks said, uh, oops, anyone pronounce that? I can't. Uh, but we translate it as planet, or wandering stars. I love this image because it shows all the planets to scale, lined up between Earth on the uh, left and moon on the right, also to scale, and the distance between Earth and moon is to scale. So you have exactly enough room to fit them all in, plus, and I didn't realize this, but there's 700,000 plus asteroids would fit in this narrow gap that's only about two-thirds the width of Earth. So it's, I love to start off with this when I talk about the solar system, and if you take Saturn here and flip it on its side, you'll notice that it stretches almost from Earth to Moon. So as well as the fact that uh, Saturn will float, 
you've got that little fact. Now, if we look at some of these wandering stars, um, we've got Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Um, we've got down at the bottom left here, Venus quite bright, but close to the horizon on May 2nd. I'm not sure you'd make out Mercury, but you have sort of your guidepost there in a thin moon crescent. Uh, Mars on May 6th, 7th, also near the beginning of the month, um, comes very close to um, the moon um, here in Taurus. Mercury is really past its prime for viewing. Uh, it goes superior conjunction with the sun, uh, third week of May. Uh, Venus, you better get your shots the next couple of weeks before it gets too close to the sun. In Mars, it's still visible, but getting lower uh, every day. And here is perhaps an interesting opportunity, although it is low at only 8 degrees at, say, 1030-ish. Uh, going through the um, M35, uh, lovely bright cluster. Hopefully it'll be bright enough to see that close to the horizon. But on these two days, you might be able to catch that and, and get a little photo of that. Let's move on to the outer planets, the uh, gas giants. Now, Beginning of the month, they don't rise before midnight, but uh, by the end of this period, they rise two hours earlier, so you're going to start to be able to get Jupiter at a comfortable hour in the late, late evening. Uh, on the 20th, uh, on the 20th, did I say 4 a.m.? Okay, 4 a.m. Uh, we've got Jupiter uh, near the moon, and on the 21st, the moon is on the other side of Jupiter. So there's uh, a photo opportunity in the south. Saturn uh, on the 25th, which is tonight, and it looks like it's going to be clear tonight. Uh, I think you knew that because we've got a meeting tonight. <laughs> uh, Saturn uh, will be close to the moon, and another potential photo op for you. Now, as far as Jovian events, I look through the handbook and also uh, Cal Sky, a, a really great site for calculating events for the transits uh, of Jupiter's moons and for the great red spot. And I highlighted a few. There's quite a few uh, transits, but some happen during the day, so we're, they're not good for us. These I've highlighted. This one here, maybe May 18th, when Ganymede is in occultation and then comes out mid-morning, and then Io goes uh, across Jupiter's face in the cha shadow transits as well and Jupiter's placed nicely in the sky for that. Uh, as far as uh, transits of the Great Red Spot, it, since Jupiter's turning every 10 hours, there's quite a few. Probably a couple of the best ones might be May 3rd and 15th, just after midnight, uh, when uh, you could see the uh, Great uh, Red Spot. And Going on to Uranus and Neptune, uh, they're kind of poor morning targets. I think you might have seen Uranus on the earlier slide. Uh, it's getting lost in the glare of the sun's dawn. Uh, this uh, conjunction with Venus, only about a degree uh, away, maybe you would see something on the 18th, but I think it would probably be too bright to make out Uranus. And Neptune, uh, it's rising um, earlier as the month progresses, so 5 a.m. at the beginning and uh, an hour and a half earlier. 
no conjunctions there. Uh, this is probably one of the best uh, opportunities to uh, get a photo op, I think, during the month. Uh, we've got the moon, the quarter moon, passing right through the beehive. So if you take a series of shots, maybe you could put it together and have something uh, like this. It should be quite interesting. And since I've got the theme of Mother's Day, what about mothers on the moon? Now, there aren't many craters named after mothers on the moon. There are less than 2%. Uh, NASA even had a fight getting the Astronomical Union to agree to naming uh, this mountain that uh, Lovell saw on Apollo 8 50 years ago when orbiting the moon. And he nicknamed it uh, Mount Marilyn after his wife. There was such a groundswell to keep the name because everyone had been using it that the Union relented and it's called Mount, uh, Mount Marilyn. But I highlighted three of the uh, creators named after women. Levitt was Henrietta Levitt, who was a human computer. If you saw the movie Hidden, Fig Hidden Figures, they talked about the human computers doing calculations for NASA space programs. Uh, Levitt was doing calculations for Harvard, for Pickering, Professor Pickering, and uh, she identified the relationship between the luminosity and period of Cepheid variables. Uh, Caroline Herschel has her own crater on the near side, uh, near, uh, on the west side of Mare Imbria. And Marie Curie lost out because her husband got uh, the name, uh, a, a crater named Curie after himself on the near side. So they used her maiden name, Sklodowska, uh, to name a rather large crater on the far side, about 127 kilometers in uh, diameter on the far side, and it turns out that there's also a Curie crater on Mars, this time named Curie after Marie Curie. Now, I always like to find something interesting to look at on the moon, so I came across this interesting contrast between a very young crater, well, 100 million years old is young for the moon, and a very ancient one, almost as old as the solar system, four billion years old, Clavius. They're both in the same area here on the top right of the South Pole, Tycho, above Clavius. And uh, Tycho, everyone knows, is noted for its bright ray system, which you can look for on May 18th. Uh, and here, there are some LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, shots of uh, Tycho with the mountain in the middle. I didn't include, right here, there's a giant boulder that I caught in great detail as well. You can look that up. It's quite interesting. Uh, so Tycho is quite young. Uh, I don't think the, astronaut, uh, the uh, dinosaurs with their poor eyesight would have seen it, that asteroid crash into it. Um, this uh, Clavius, on the other hand, very old, very well preserved. It has this interesting arc of about five craters of diminishing size. So one uh, thing you might try to do is observe with your scope say around the quarter moon or a couple of days past uh, May 13th and see how many of those you can see starting with Rutherford here on the rim. Um, both these craters have to be named after astronomers and like a lot of famous features in the solar system they appear somewhere in science fiction in this case 2001 Space Odyssey 
the Emin base on the moon was near Clavius, and the uh, black giant monoliths in 2001 were found in Tycho. Now, space debris. Um, you could say that meteors, they're flashing uh, lights uh, like d diamonds flying through the sky, are uh, uh, a gift for mothers everywhere. Uh, the Eta Quarids meteor shower occurs in uh, May. Uh, Pallas, that was mentioned last month, is still uh, there and visible. Uh, probably this will be the last month. And comets, not so much, nothing quite bright enough. Uh, zodiacal light, I think we're past the point of seeing that from anywhere around uh, here at a dark site or whatever. And ISS passes starting the end of this month. There are a number of ISS passes in the morning and in the evening. I've shown three, well, sorry, four of the brighter ones here uh, going from uh, west to east here uh, that cross a great part of the sky. So good opportunities to take a photo or observe those or point them out to the neighbor's kids. And let's talk about the fireworks, the meteor shower, the Eta Quarids. Now, if you're like me, you, you may not be around for the next coming of Halley's Comet. So this is a good opportunity to see what Halley's Comet left behind. Uh, the the or Orionids, uh, the week before Halloween, is the other um, meteor shower whose origin is from Halley's Comet. Uh, by the way, Halley's does not cross Earth's path anymore. These uh, st uh, streams of uh, dust and debris were left in Earth's path uh, hundreds of years ago by uh, Halley, Comet Halley. Um, May 6 is the center for this uh, meteor shower. Uh, it stretches on either side. You might see... Um, uh, meteors on either side of that date. I think you're going to get quite a bit less than 40 per hour because it's so low on the horizon, although it d does rise by 5 a.m. a fair bit up in the sky. Uh, there's no moon to interfere with it like there was for the Lyrids this month. So give it a shot to look for the 80. Uh, Aquarius and celebrate Victoria's Day or Mother's Day. Asteroids. So I apologize for the mess on this slide, but this shows Pallas, the second um, asteroid discovered. Uh, it goes at quite an angle to the uh, solar system plane. It's well placed in uh, Coma Berenice. Uh, just between there and Butes. Um, but you'll notice that it's starting to, the path from our point of view, it's starting to get, not move as quickly. Down here in the next couple of weeks, uh, you probably could see uh, movement of the asteroid, say within 30 minutes or an hour. So if you can go to Heavens Above or your favorite planetarium software and get your star chart and locate where it might be, <coughs> observe it, observe the stars, mark them down. I'm not an imager, uh, so I do it visually. And then come back later in the evening and check and see what's moved. And that would be your way of uh, catching uh, Pallas. Now, for those of you who did miss naming Jupiter's moons, I know this isn't an asteroid, but there's 2007 OR10 is one of the largest unnamed um, Kuiper Belt objects, and they're looking for a name. So you can go to the website, 
just look up 2000 OR 10 and naming and you'll find the website. You can go there, find out more information. Uh, there's three mythological figures to vote between. One uh, Chinese uh, figure, another one a European, and another one a uh, uh, Nordic one. And I voted for Ville because Ville along with Odin and uh, another brother, they killed the frost god, Ymir, Y-M-I-R, and from Ymir's body, they created the universe and earth, and I thought that was a good story, though it doesn't tie into the reddish color that this KBO has, whereas uh, I think this one does. So have a look and uh, make your entry. Now, this is the sky about middle of the four-week period, the month. Um, I probably should have picked it later in the evening so it would be a little bit darker, but I wanted to show uh, Mars down here. And uh, just some of the... You can see that all the winter constellations are pretty well gone. And the summer constellations are starting to rise and uh, we'd be well-placed in the early morning hours. But still, we've got Leo and Virgo with all the galaxies in there to observe. Um, here's the beehive. And r right up here, following the Mother's Day theme, there's Iota in Cancer. And near Iota, there is... Uh, 55 Cancery, which you probably can't see, but 55 Cancery E is an exoplanet going around 55 Cancery, which is made out of crystallized diamond. Now, wouldn't that be a great gift <laughs> for your mother? Uh, they've estimated that this is worth 27 nonillion dollars, US dollars too. <laughs> so a nonillion is, for those who don't know, and I had no clue, it's 10 to the 30th. So that would make every mother and then some very wealthy woman on earth. <laughs> so then we've got Leo here, some lovely, you know, Leo triplet, Martarian's chain. Um, we've got... A, the great uh, coma cluster here. I just love that in binoculars. We've got uh, around Polaris. How many knew there was a diamond ring there? So Polaris is the gemstone, and around it is a circle of faint stars. I'll show you that in a moment. And then we've got all of these um, gobs and gobs of globulars that are rising, like M3, M5, 13, 92, and all these in Ophicius. So lots to look at in the coming month before we get to those really short nights in June, July. In celestial mothers in the sky, out of all of the 88 constellations, there's only three and a half that are named after mothers. Cassiopeia, the polar constellation, Andromeda, her daughter, uh, Virgo, the maiden, next to Leo, and uh, Coma Berenices. Berenices was a queen of Egypt who sacrificed her hair to the gods in order to um, get their favor so that her husband returned safely from the war with Syria. Uh, this is Ptol Ptolemy the second, I think. I don't know whether that happened or not, but the gods took favor on her and put her hair in the sky, and that's the lovely uh, coma uh, cluster that we see in the heavens. Now, here, here's the important part of Mother's Day. What do you give your mother? So, what is there in the night sky? And 
if you've been to a really, really dark site like on the top of Mauna Kea or in the Atacama Desert, you know that the night sky itself, the stars there are so bright and sharp that it looks like jewels, so I'm not going to count that here. But I have some other jewelry. There's flowers in the sky, and I know you've thought of one or two, but I'll surprise you with another. And there's chocolate in the sky. And I bet you wonder what that is, but you'll have to wait a minute. So here's the diamond ring. So there's, Pola uh, yeah, there's Polaris, and there's a ring of stars, much fainter, going around it, going around the gemstone. So that's the diamond ring, an asterism in uh, Ursa Minor. Uh, this uh, galaxy is called, nicknamed Bernice's hair clip as well. I mentioned the Coma star cluster. Uh, there's the crown, Corona Borealis, in the South Australia. And there's this real interesting one. You know, Blake talks a lot, it has, has some very interesting double stars. I don't know whether he's had this one, but it's called uh, Chapel's Arc around H1470 there, which is a, a true double star. There's an arc of double stars, bright ones there. But if you look carefully, there's a whole ring of much fainter ones. Um, so this, I've got to try uh, going for this. I haven't looked for this. Uh, Cygnus will be higher after midnight this time of year, so it's something you might want to try to look for and even capture an image like this. Uh, it's quite unique. I think the only double is probably this one up here, the H1470. And I've put in the other coordinates here because I found Starry Night and Stellarium didn't have H1470. But they do have these two. Uh, Ring Nebula, of course, little gem. Um, but flowers. Okay, flowers. Everyone thinks, say, the Rosette Nebula or Iris Nebula. Um, I hadn't heard of Caroline's Rose, but there's an open cluster in Cass Cassiopeia. And the interesting thing I found is that just as a lot of asteroids are named after goddesses, there are quite a number, 86, named after flowers and plants. So who would have known that there's a Begonia asteroid or Orcus or Tulipa or Azalea? But I think it's kind of neat. So there are flowers in the night sky. And now we come to the final one, chocolate. This is a bit of a cheat, <laughs> okay? Because if you look at any galaxy, even the Hamburger Galaxy, I saw that in southern Arizona in this 20-inch Maksudov, is just gorgeous with the dark band in the middle and the cap on top and bottom is wonderful. But it wasn't brown. But all the images, all the images that you see have the dust lanes as brown or brownish. So that's why I say there's chocolate in the night sky. Okay, uh, just a little more detail and a little better image of this fairy ring. You can see the double stars going around here. Uh, they're all opticals, but still it's kind of nifty to track this down. To track it down, go between Eta Cygni and Gamma here, Seder, and if you find 25 Cygni, which is bright enough, then just a little ways over is H1470, or whatever you want to <coughs> use as the designation. And you'll find that. You can see, um, you could probably see this from a dark site uh, with binoculars, but really you'd need a telescope to draw out the fainter uh, stars down below. So that's the fairy ring, or I should call it Chapel's Art because he was the amateur who really discovered it. Uh, I've already talked about uh, quite a few of these. Um, 
when I was in Arizona, I just had my binoculars with me, so I was picking out some of these, like in the Leo triplet, the brighter, uh, brighter galaxies, and you could see them either directly or with averted vision, uh, sombrero. So there are the ones I was talking about on the uh, earlier slide. And everyone must have heard about the first image of the black hole. And Markarian's chain here, just around here, is where M87 is. It's a fairly bright galaxy. Um, this is from Chandra, uh, X-ray image, and you can clearly see the jet coming out of the um, center core of the galaxy. And there's the famous image now of the black hole. And you can see that all of our solar system, out to Pluto and beyond into the Kuiper belt and Oort cloud, will fit within there. I mean, actually, Voyager is already passed out of our solar system, so there it's the size of our solar system, this black hole. You can't see it, but you can search for uh, the galaxy. And I was talking to someone, I'm not a, a nighttime photographer. <laughs> I take... I don't take astrophotos, I take other photos. But looking through an eyepiece, this is what you'd see with uh, eight inch, and on this side, the fainter galaxies here, a 10 inch scope from a very dark site. And this happens to be done by a very good um, uh, astro sketcher. But you can see the, with a little bit of um, aperture, you can see the dust bands, uh, and they won't be chocolate, unfortunately. And I just want to add, I found this uh, website that has galaxy viewing with binoculars. So it talks about what you can see um, and how you might see it and what it might look like. I thought it was pretty interesting, pretty good. And. I've always wanted to put this up to talk to uh, people about it, but never had an opportunity until now. So here are my guinea pigs. Wolf 359. Um, it's too faint for us to, in most cases, see, though you might image it. But we talk about stars not moving. They're constant in the same position in our lifetimes. Well. Wolf 359 happens to be the fifth nearest star to uh, us at eight light years. And it does have a proper motion across our field of view of five seconds of arc a year. So that what that means is that in your lifetime, Wolf 359 will move about a quarter of a full moon quarter of a full moon. So this is one of the closest stars. And um, Bernard's star has a greater proper motion. It's double that, 10 uh, arc seconds per year. So it would move half a full moon's width in your lifetime. So the stars do move. And the other neat thing about Wolf 359, no one shouted it out, but Star Trek, Battle of Wolf 359, where the Borg defeated the Federation, and of course, Picard and the Enterprise saved Earth uh, later on. So, something to look forward to. Occultations, there's nothing that I found in our neck of the woods. You'd have to move out west or down south to, I mean south-south, to uh, see any interesting occultations this month. So I'll turn now to space missions. And I really love uh, Olaf Frohn here in the upper uh, left. He does this chart every month. It's great. It shows all the missions. I want to point out a few. Uh, I don't know what's going to be happening the next month, but some recent events on the uh, Hayabusa 
over here, looking at, uh, how do I say this now? Rigu. I had it written down, but I... Rigu, and then Osiris Rex over on this side, Bennu. Uh, over here, we have something that Insight did. Maybe some of you read about it today. Uh, and we, of course, have Beersheet, the Israeli uh, lander that landed on the moon rather abruptly recently. And I want to point out this here, this red mark. This is one thing that Olaf missed. I don't know why, but I'll, I'll add that at the end. I'll talk about that. So, OSIRIS-REx. NASA got there and discovered that it's incredibly rocky. It doesn't appear to be much in the way of flat surface. So they're spending the next little while imaging it and trying to find a reasonably flat site to bring their uh, lander down and take a sample. Now the Japanese Hayabusa 2, there's been some great images of it. Uh, here's its shadow on the surface, uh, very craggy, craggy. And then over here, just recently, it did one of its shots of a projectile into to make a crater. And then it scooted around the other side, but before it got there, it captured an image of the debris flying off into space. So I thought that was kind of neat. They'll do another uh, sample and explore it uh, soon. And then uh, Israel, small country, big dreams. Here's the selfie that it shot just before it landed on the moon. Uh, it crashed on the moon, um, about double the size of a washing machine. They're going to try again. The Israeli government this time is going to provide more funding to the private company, Space IL, which did it all through, I think, $100 million of donations. Um, so they're going to try again, and we'll see if they make it there. But today, uh, Mars Insight, uh, NASA announced that at, on the 6th of April, they detected a two and a half magnitude earthquake, or Mars quake, the first uh, quake recorded not on planet Earth. So that's uh, a big uh, event. And then finally, remember that red arrow on the top? So Earth was down here and the red arrow is up here. So this is Elon Musk's, uh, I think it was his personal Tesla Roadster. It was launched with uh, a dummy dressed in an uh, astronaut suit called Starman, sitting in the driver's seat with a radio blaring, playing Bowie's Space Oddity. Uh, this time it's gone that far around. It orbits in 557 days. Uh, this would be a great present for mom if you could somehow get it back to Earth. <laughs> Uh, next year, it gets much closer to Earth, and just as some people tried to it, and did image it uh, when it was taking off and going out into its orbit, maybe it would be possible to catch an image when it comes back. I'm not sure what condition it will be in because micrometeorites and uh, solar wind will probably have wrecked habit with the paint job and probably all the organics like the uh, rubber tires or the seats. So it may need to be touched up before you give it to mom. Uh, the battery, no doubt, if it's still playing, will probably need a replacement too. Um, and you're going to have to pay out of your own pocket because the warranty's uh, completely shot by 14,000 <laughs> times. So, um, Let's talk about space launches. So space launches. What struck me about 
of this month of space launches is there's every nationality and all kinds of countries launching uh, spacecraft, excuse me, into space. Uh, first of all, we have a cargo mission to the space station at the beginning of uh, this period. We have a rather interesting uh, military one here from the US, tracking of space debris, certainly that's needed. Um, situational awareness. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds very military. Um, a number of communication satellites here, um, here navigation, Canadian, uh, a triple launch, so one rocket launching three satellites, three radar sets um, for various monitoring. Uh, Israel, Space IL, the private company, uh, is launching from, uh, oh, I didn't say where it's launching from, um, a satellite, and another Russian one, this one here. And this one here, I put it on Chandrayaan, to the second probe that India would send to the moon. The first one just orbited. This one, the intention is to land on the moon and deploy a rover to do some exploring. It's been delayed many, many times, and they had some problems with the lander. I think something broke on the legs. They have not changed the um, launch date from May but likely they're going to shift to June or July, probably July because of better prospects, I understand. It'll be one to watch because they would be the first non-superpower to land on the moon and the uh, fourth nation. So here I have a summary of what I talked about, uh, some of the highlights in the sky this night. Um, today happens to be the anniversary of the Hubble launch, uh, 29, almost 30 years ago. Um, we've got Celsius uh, passed away on the 25th. Jan Oort was a well-known uh, radio astronomer, and he also is n noted for a discovery of dark matter. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention May the 4th. Uh, everyone knows that. Uh, Otto von Strauff was a German-Russian uh, astronomer in the 19th century. International Astronomy Day here, Mother's Day on the 12th. And 50 years ago, hard to believe, 50 years ago, the fifth mission the Russians sent to Venus landed successfully and lasted 53 minutes before it uh, succumbed to the heat and toxic uh, climate. And lastly but not least, Wilhelmina Fleming was a human computer, just like the ones we saw in NASA and Hidden Figures, working for Professor Edward Pickering in Harvard and she helped develop a stellar classification system. She cataloged thousands of stars and other astronomical phenomena. And she also discovered the Horsehead Nebula in, back in 1888. So that's the presentation. Here are some references, and this will probably be posted. Um, I found Cal Sky. I used the wrong name earlier, but CalSky, very useful for calculation of vents for Jupiter. Um, and uh, the Rask handbook was, was great for that as well. Um, I carry this with me all the time, the um, OITH, Objects in the Heavens. I have a hard copy, but I also have a, a soft copy. Uh, it goes down to MAG-10, and it has lots of interesting information on the solar system, the stars, the constellations, uh, double stars, carbon stars, and 
along the Terminator, what craters and objects you can see on the moon. And then the bulk of the book is, by constellation, what are the key objects you can see there. They're all encoded, and the RAs and decks are given. It's been a very useful and interesting uh, uh, book. We bought it a while ago, uh, a large group we arranged, because the cost of it is fairly high on the shipping, and we got a discount when we got about 20 or 30 people. So if you're interested, maybe post, and you could arrange that. Uh, Biren's book is, is pretty neat, something different. And with that, <laughs> happy Mother's Day. Questions? I'm off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yep. Didn't mention all, all this viewing, of course, it depends on Mother Nature, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Gaia, Gaia is Mother Earth, Mother <laughs> Nature. Yeah. Any other comments or yeah. yeah Charlene <laughs> I, I, I just thought it was very clever of you to talk so much about lunacy for your Mother's Day presentation <laughs> <laughs> well the, the next month is uh, Father's Day so we'll see what there's a golf putter asterism, so whoever talks can talk about the golf putter asterism. Comments, questions? Thank you, everyone. And so our second and final speaker for the evening uh, is Elizabeth Tasker, and a quick brief introduction. So Elizabeth is a researcher and science communicator at the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency in Tokyo. Originally from the UK, Elizabeth read theoretical physics at Durham University before continuing to complete a doctorate in astrophysics at the University of Oxford. Her research explores the formation of stars and planets using computer simulations, and she built these virtual universes at institutes in the USA and Canada before moving on to Japan. 
Elizabeth's popular science book on planet formation, The Planet Factory, was published in 2017. And she also is a writer for the NASA uh, Next Many Worlds Online online column. Uh, we're also going to have a uh, Planet Factory book signing after the meeting. Elizabeth? So today I thought we would take a look at some of the worlds we've discovered beyond our own solar system, ones that we can't actually currently visit with spacecraft. But before we go there, I'm going to start with what I hope is a familiar picture. This, of course, is our own solar system, and we are surrounded by eight planets. We have four rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And these are planets with a solid surface, like that, and also a thin atmosphere. And then further out, we have our four gas and ice giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And until the start of the 1990s, these were all the planets that we knew. We didn't really think they were the only ones that existed, but we couldn't see any evidence of planets around other stars until our telescopes became good enough. However, before the 1990s, a wobble was detected around uh, with a star called Gamma Zephy. And Gamma Zephy was moving very slightly to and from the direction of the Earth, looking like it was making a very small orbit. And it was proposed that this wobbling motion might be due to an unseen, much smaller body whose gravity was making a very gentle tug on that star and causing that wobble. So could this have been an exoplanet detection? Well, there were some problems. The first was that Gamma Zephy was not alone in the sky. This star was part of a binary system, meaning there were actually two stars orbiting one another. Now, our sun doesn't have a binary companion, so the first skepticism was, well, can you even form planets if you've got, like, two stars rather than one? And the second problem was that Gamma Zephy itself was a giant star. Now, these are stars that are approaching the end of their life, and as they get quite old, these stars get a bit cantankerous. And that means their outer atmosphere has a lot of pulsations and vibrations that could look uh, just like a wobble from an unseen planet. So the astronomers summed this up in the late 1980s and concluded that yes, they had seen this wobble, but they decided it was unlikely to be a planet. And when they made that statement, they actually missed discovering the first exoplanet because this wobble was due to a planet, but it wasn't confirmed until about 2013. So what went wrong? I mean, this should have been the first exoplanet discovered several years in front of when the first exoplanet announcement truly came. So to understand why we were so skeptical about Gamma Zephy, and in particular why everyone was so skeptical about the binary star system's capability of forming a planet, we need to take a quick 101 of how we think planets form. So young stars are observed to be surrounded by disks of dust and gas that we call protoplanetary disks. And almost all stars are seen to have these, suggesting that they all have, or at least begin with, these planet-building kits. And these are absolutely outstanding images by the telescope ALMA that we've got relatively recently. But now ALMA has seen these disks around many, many stars. And in these disks, we start off with microscopic grains of dust, which start to collide and stick. And as they do, they form steadily bigger objects, becoming sort of millimeter, centimeter, meter-sized, sort of asteroid-sized. And eventually, gravity finally gets a bit of enthusiasm, and it pulls those large rocks into spherical shapes. And we have something that looks like a planet. So this is what the system might look like top down. We have our star in the center, and we have our rocky so-called planetesimals around the outside on fairly circular orbits that are going to collide and stick and give us a planet. However, 
If you throw another star into the mix, these rocks that are going to build your planet and the gas disk around the star is going to feel both the gravity of that first star that they're orbiting, but also an additional pull from the second star. And this is going to have two rather dastardly effects. The first is that second star's gravity is going to tug on that disk of gas, and it's going to create a bulge. And as that disk tries to rotate around the first star, they'll end up with a drag force caused by the presence of the second star's gravity. And that actually slows the gas down. Now, as the gas slows in speed, it starts falling towards the first star. So the disk actually starts to contract and shrink. And if the disk gets smaller, that basically means we have less time to start forming these planets, because we're going to end up with a smaller disk than if we had just one star on its own. The second problem is that this star is also pulling on the rocky planetesimals themselves that we want to collide and stick and build up the planet. And this pulls them from very nice circular orbits into more wild elliptical paths around the star. And this turns out to be deeply unsatisfactory for building a decent-sized planet. So it turns out that if you're in a circular orbit, everything close to you is going to be moving at roughly the same speed, because your speed is proportional to your distance from the star. So if everything is moving at roughly the same speed, if you do happen to collide, you'll collide very gently. And that means you'll just come together and stick. However, if you are on wildly different elliptical orbits, you'll be on very different speeds with the stuff you collide with. And that leads to much, much faster collisions. So rather than a gentle coming together and a stick that builds you up a large object, you come together very fast and you're much more likely to rebound, which does not help if you're trying to build a planet. And these theories were confirmed that, generally speaking, having at least a stellar sibling is immensely bad for your health. So the Kepler Space Telescope, one of our greatest planet finders of all time, looked at stars that were in binary systems. And what Kepler saw was that if your distance between your two stars is more than 1,500 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, what we call 1 AU, then you're fine. You don't care anymore. Planet formation is unaffected. You can go ahead and build those planets. Less than that, and you've got a problem. However, just because it's harder if you have a stellar sibling does not mean it's impossible. And in particular, what Kepler saw was if the distance between the two stars was 100 to 1,000 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, although it was rarer, both stars could form these protoplanetary disks and start building planets. If you shrink that distance, and we take it down to of order 10 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, then both stars can no longer have a protoplanetary disk. Instead, you end up with just one of those stars forming a gas disk of gas and dust and being able to form some planets, and its sibling is left childless. If we move even closer, something else happens. Now our two stars are only about the same distance as the Earth and the Sun, so they're super close. There is no space for disks to sit in between these two stars. But you can have a disk that goes around both stars. And actually, in theory, that leads to a very familiar landscape. That is the concept between Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's home of Tatooine. So here you've got two stars in the sky. You are pretty close together. And if this planet really existed, it would have formed in a disk that looped both stars together. And this leads to a, a very obvious question. Could a planet with two stars actually be habitable? Well, one of the first questions we ask when we consider planet habitability is how much sunlight is that planet receiving? And in particular, we often talk about something called the so-called habitable zone. Now, there is some small print with the habitable zone, namely that when we normally talk about this concept for exoplanets, we are really thinking of the Earth. 
So the habitable zone normally means where around the star could our planet, our Earth, support liquid water on its surface. So at the inner edge of the habitable zone, our oceans would start to evaporate. We're receiving too much sunlight. At the outer edge, our nice carbon dioxide, which was keeping us kind of toasty, freezes. And that is not good. And then we freeze. So, but in between, if we were orbiting anywhere inside that habitable zone, the Earth could support liquid water. And we actually know that this is only applicable to the Earth in this circumstance, because Venus sits outside the habitable zone, very appropriate, not a habitable planet. But the Moon and Mars both orbit inside the Earth's habitable zone. But neither of these planets can support liquid water on their surface. And that is because they are smaller than the Earth, they've got a lower surface pressure, then they don't have the atmosphere that we have. So if you were to draw the habitable zone for Mars and Earth, if that was possible, it would sit in a different location to us. However, what if you've got two stars? Well, Let's start with one again. If we have one, then the habitable zone is a sphere around that star. So it's as long as you're a certain distance from the star, then you will be in this habitable zone. If you have two stars of approximately equal mass, so sort of twins, that habitable zone gets squished into a peanut. And so now you've got two sources of radiation and you just get a kind of oval shape that looks in 3D, like a, one of those huge capsules you might have to swallow for medicine. If your stars are different masses, so one is more hefty than the other, what you get is a sort of spherical system, but with a kind of grapefruit stuck on the side of it for the smaller star that's providing that extra burst of starlight. And you might look at these and think, well, I mean, they're maybe not quite as easy to remain habitable in these, but I could imagine dropping the Earth into either the second choice or the third choice, and I could still probably mark out some sort of orbit that keeps me safely in the habitable zone, and I should be able to become a Jedi Knight. However, there is some small print. And that is, what you have to remember is these stars are not stationary. They are orbiting one another. So what that means is the amount of radiation, the amount of starlight that planet is receiving does not remain constant. So if you are sort of near the edge of the habitable zone, you might find that you actually move in and out of it during your year. So you might have temperate conditions for part of the time, but then you slide into the outside and freeze and slide back in. And an example of a planet we've discovered that does exactly that is Kepler-16b. And NASA did these absolutely wonderful vintage travel posters imagining what these planets might look like. Uh, actually, in this case, this planet was discovered in 2011, and it almost certainly doesn't have a solid surface because it has a mass about 100 times that of the Earth, which puts it ballpark Saturn-sized. So this is probably a, a, a gas world. But it does have this Tatooine-like system where you have stars of different masses, where one's much dimmer than the other. So its habitable zone, which Kepler-16b is just about in, will have this slightly changing area as the stars orbit one another. And this is the simulation up here on the left. So the two black circles in the middle are the two stars. And Kepler-16b is on the blue orbit around the edge. And if you were to ask how much starlight do you receive over your year, you get fluctuations that look like this. And you can see that the average temperature of this planet changes by 15 degrees Celsius. Now, you might think, oh, that's not so bad. I mean, spring being what it is, we've basically experienced that in the last week. <laughs> However, remember, this is a global change, not a local change. And to put that in perspective, we had a little ice age in the 1600s, and the Thames actually froze, which it most certainly doesn't normally. And the average global surface temperature changed during this ice age by just one to two degrees. So a change during your year, frequently of 15 degrees, is a fairly major climate alteration for a planet. Now, could, could life survive this? Well, of course we don't know, because we've only actually got one example of a habited planet. But 
it is possible that maybe life might go into hibernation during the inhospitable spells and then come out when the climate was more temperate. So in this case, we might have, you know, the force will awaken in about six months because it's currently, <laughs> currently hibernating. So another planet that is in a binary star system is 55 Cancri, which I was delighted to see was mentioned in the first talk of tonight. So this has a very small binary sibling, but 55 Cancri itself has five planets around it, and it was the first discovery of a five-planet system. Now, the distance between the main star and its small uh, sister star is rather large. It's more than 1,000 AU. So as you can see, it did not stop this star forming planets of its own. However, that's not to say that the presence of a binary sibling doesn't have a fairly significant effect. In this case, the gravitational pull from that small distant star is slowly turning the entire planetary system on its head to do a complete flip, rather like a set of synchronized swimmers. So if you were to stand on the surface of this world and look at the constellations, you would see them slowly turning around in the night sky. Now, you would have to have a rather long life expectancy to see a full flip around. It takes about 30 million years. But uh, nevertheless, the stars would not be entirely stationary over, I mean, they'd change over the night, but this would be a real flip around. Now, one of the most intriguing planets in the 55 Cancri system is the innermost world of 55 Cancri E. And when this was discovered, both its radius and mass were measured, and they didn't make much sense. 55 Cancri E is too dense to be a gas giant like Neptune or Jupiter, but it's too light to have an earthy composition. So the question was, what on Earth is this planet made of? Well, if we're looking for an in-between material between rock and gas, an obvious thought would be water. So could 55 Cancri E be a water world? Well, one of the challenges here is that it's really close to the star. So one orbit, so equivalent of one Earth year on 55 Cancri E, lasts 18 hours. Ooh, yeah. So its average temperature before we consider any effects of atmosphere whatsoever, is a rather toasty 2,000 Celsius. Yeah. So, could you honestly have any water in such a situation? This is clearly not the habitable zone for anyone. Well, the planet is quite massive. It's about twice the size of Earth, and it puts it about eight times the mass of Earth. So, the water on this planet will be at high temperatures and high pressures. And actually, in this state, while water is not a liquid, it forms instead a supercritical fluid. And this form of water is neither liquid nor gas, but sort of something in between. Uh, so if you were to exist on 55 Cancri E, you might find yourself suspended in this supercritical fluid, where you couldn't quite tell if you were in the sea or the air or where one stopped and the other began. So this was option number one. Option number two was whether we could do something with the planet's composition itself. So the Earth has a core of iron and nickel, and it has a mantle of magnesium, iron, and silicate. So could we do something with the interior of a different sort of rocky world to make it more consistent with its mass and radius? Well, and evidence for this came from observations of the star itself, which was found to be substantially more carbon rich than the sun. Now, if you have a lot more carbon in the system, it starts replacing oxygen. So instead of getting silicon and oxygen, which make our silicates, you get things like silicate carbide. So in this case, the crust of 55 Cancri E would actually be more like graphite. And further down, we would have silicon carbide and carbon, which under pressure, would form your diamonds. So a diamond world is another option for this planet. But before you think, indeed, this is a great option for Mother's Day, there is some fine print. Uh, for a start, you do have this graphite black surface. And if it was possible to maintain any kind of liquid on that surface, it would be tar. And in the atmosphere, if there is any, is quite likely in this circumstance to be carbon monoxide. So, diamond's nice, the rest, yeah, not, not so much. 
Now, a third option for this world came with some updated observations. This planet had been spotted by something we call the transit technique. And that happens when the, star, when the planet passes in front of the star as seen from Earth. And we see a small dip in the starlight. <coughs> now, in 2011, this was observed, and the, the characteristic dip that told you there was a planet there was seen. And the same observation was done a few years later. But strangely enough, the dip wasn't the same size. In this two-year period, this planet seemed to have swelled by 25%, which we don't expect planets to typically do. So we seem to have an increase in radius, and this was accompanied by an increase in the average temperature, which went from about 1,427 Celsius to 2,699 Celsius. And one theory put forward was actually this was a mind-bogglingly volcanic land. And during the period where the planet seemed bigger, there was so much volcanic activity that tons of ash had been thrown into the atmosphere and blocked out all the light passing through the atmosphere, making the planet appear much more swollen than it was otherwise. And during times when the planet appeared smaller, that volcanic ash had eased, and once again you were seeing the planet's surface. Now, regardless of these three rather gruesome options, there is also something interesting about 55 Cancri E. As I mentioned, the year takes just 18 hours. And if you are very close to the star, as this one is, the star's gravity is going to be very strong. And this is going to cause the star to exert some pressure on the planet and squish it into a rugby ball shape and apparently change the year to just 17 hours. But no, it's about 17 and a half. <laughs> so if you become a bit of a rugby ball shaped, then as you try to rotate around the star, you have a bulge that's going to attempt to move away from that star. But as it attempts to move away, the star's gravity is going to pull on it and force it back into the same position. And so as a result, the planet ends up always facing the same direction towards the star, and we call this tidal lock. And this is the same situation as the moon around the Earth, where the same side of the moon always faces the Earth. But a planet in a tidal lock, of course, only has sunlight on one side. So what you end up with is a split world where one side is permanently day, and the other side is eternal night. And if you have a more temperate conditions, this might lead to a rather interesting effect. So our nearest star is Proxima Centauri, and it has a planet around it, Proxima Centauri b. Now, one year, so one orbit for Proxima Centauri b, lasts just 11.2 days. And you might think that is not really much better than the 17 hours. It's still really rather short. But it turns out that Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf, which is a very small and dim star and gives out a lot less radiation than the sun. So that actually places Proxima Centauri b inside the habitable zone, meaning that if it was a twin of Earth, it could potentially support water on its surface. However, its proximity to the star means it will be in tidal lock. So what you might end up with is a planet that looks like this. So you have desert on one side, you have complete freeze on the other. But in between, you might have this band of water that potentially allows life to exist. So the surface on such a world might look like this, where the sun is just permanently on the horizon to give you a kind of twilight zone where you could actually build some life. So an obvious question is, could we actually go and check out these planets and find out what they're like? The problem is, though, this nearest exoplanet, Proxima Centauri b, even if we sent our fastest and furthest spacecraft towards it, which is Voyager 1 and is not pointing in the right direction, it would still take it a rather staggering 75,000 years. So it's not really practical for a holiday or even a scientific career. But that does not mean we're not going to find out a lot about these planets. In particular, there are some instruments out that are going to look for these atmospheres around these planets. The top one with the date of 2021 is a provisional launch date for the James Webb Space Telescope. And below it at 2028 is the European Space Agency's aerial mission, which is purely devoted to planetary atmospheres. 
And the idea here is as the planet transits in front of the star, some of that starlight will actually pass through the planet's atmosphere. And when it does, molecules in the atmosphere will absorb very particular wavelengths. So what you would see is that if you are at a wavelength where the atmosphere doesn't absorb, the planet will appear one particular size. However, at other wavelengths, where there might be molecules in the atmosphere absorbing strongly, the planet will appear to grow in size. The effect won't be nearly as strong as it was 55 Cancri E, but it is measurable. So by mapping that backwards, you can say, OK, certain wavelengths are not passing through this planet's atmosphere. And you know what molecules absorb what wavelengths. So you can make a guess at what molecules must be in the atmosphere. And that gives us our first hint as to what's going on on the surface. So it tells you something about the chemistry and geology of the planet, and maybe even whether there's biology on that surface. So the truth is out there. So if you want to know about even worse planets than this, uh, so hot Jupiters, Jupiter-sized planets with tiny orbits, Tatooine-like worlds, or if stars just appall you, rogue worlds with no stars at all, or planets with seas of lava and tar, um, I have all of these in that book, and I'm really happy to sign a copy if anyone would like one afterwards. Thank you very much. And really happy to answer questions too. <laughs> Just too shocked to answer, I understand. <laughs> You're working with the Japanese Space Agency, yes. JAXA. So what uh, kind of research are you doing there? I model the formation of planets and stars. I use computer simulations to look at how they form and how they evolve. Um, so just like the work I've sort of presented here. Um, and also I help with the English outreach for several of the missions, including Hayabusa 2. So what kind of a multiplying effect would you see contributed by the uh, potential habitable zone around a gas giant, the moon of a gas giant? Ah, yes. That's really interesting because within the habitable zone, as we've defined it, we've found almost 15 times as many planets that are unlikely to be rocky as ones that might be more gaseous like Jupiter. But as we know from the gas giants in our own solar system, these systems are mobbed with moons, which gives you the question of, uh, was it Endor, I think, is a moon? And the, you know, the Ewok home and the one of the Avatar, I think, propose this. But you're right, there are other effects in place. You have radiation from the star, but you also have reflected radiation from the gas giant, which cannot be ignored. So you end up with two heating effects, not quite as strong as a very close binary, but definitely significant. So in that case, you may very well find that you need to be a little bit further out in order to maintain cool enough temperatures to support liquid water. Another thing that's notable from our own gas giant moons is they're often on elliptical orbits because the moons themselves exert a gravitational tug on one another and that maintains this slightly bent orbit. And that can give you tidal heating as it approaches the planet and moves further away. It gets squished like a stress ball. And so you get an additional source of heating. So you have to take that into account again, which again pushes you further out. So it's not impossible to imagine that the most habitable place for an Earth-like moon might actually be outside the habitable zone. No one else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Ms. said, and I'm just here to briefly follow up on an announcement that everyone who was a uh, who is a member of RASC Toronto Centre should have gotten in the past day, which is our anti-harassment policy, which we have passed through Council, we've developed and we've implemented. So I really encourage everyone to have a look at the policy. The intent of the policy is to make sure that we are an open and welcoming environment, uh, that everyone finds, finds RASC Toronto Centre a welcoming home and is not harassed, basically. So the message that was sent out by our president ralph should did, did include a link so you can actually look at the policy and again i encourage people to actually look at it because it's about two or three pages and the reason i'm up here is i'm one of the people who actually worked on the wording and made sure it was edited and i believe that we came up with something that is pretty clear straightforward easy to read um what we really and it will also apply, like I'll note that it applies to members, it applies to non-members who attend our events and any interactions between members or between members and non-members. So that includes at the Car Astronomical Observatory, it would include at any um, outreach events that we hold. Um, and there is a reporting method and we will have, if there's any sort of issues, we encourage people to actually report them. It's all in the message there. We have the stuff in our members only site, so you'd have to log in as your member. Um, if there's an incident, report the incident. It will get investigated and there will be resolutions to that. And all that again is found in the policy in, in basic English. It's not written in lawyerese. I'm not a lawyer. And Basically, this is something that we are implementing from going forward here, and you know, if anyone has actually read the policy or anyone has any questions on the policy, you can you can ask me right now. But otherwise, you know, have to read it. Everyone, so everyone promises to read it, right? Great. If you have any questions, I mean, I think the forum was a good place to ask questions if you're on the forum. Once you've read it and you have any specifics, I'll be glad to respond or members of the council or Ralph will be glad to respond and clarify anything that you find possibly confusing or, or unclear. But like I say, we try to make it as clear as possible and as simple as possible. We, we are welcoming everyone to the center and we are not being prejudiced or we're not being harassing of any members. And that goes for events, it goes for online forum, and hopefully we don't have incidents. And if there are, we're going to take care of them so we don't have them in the future. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to wrap things up with the announcements uh, of things coming up. So uh, our next meeting is in two weeks' time on May 8th. Uh, it is a speaker's night, but May is one of those funny months. Uh, Paul Delaney has been working his uh, Farley file uh, diligently, even though he's down under. And um, his friends are remarkably resistant to doing a talk in May. So uh, we hope we'll have somebody to speak, but we don't know who yet. So take a look at the website, keep watching it, and hopefully we will have a name up there uh, fairly soon. Otherwise, I may have to do something myself. So we'll see what happens. Okay, two weeks after that will be our next recreational astronomy night, and uh, hopefully Paul Markov will have recovered and uh, be able to uh, be the host for that event. And uh, he does have a full billing for that evening. So starts off with Andy Beaton uh, doing The Sky This Month, uh, Father's Day edition maybe. Uh, Jim Chung will be talking about how to build your own 10-inch Schiff Spiegler planet killer. Very apt after Elizabeth's talk tonight. Uh, Ed Trez uh, will be talking about the Carr Astronomical Observatory, Recycling and You. And then we have a return visit from the Nath family uh, with the LIGO quadruple pendulum, which is a really interesting experiment and uh, uh, should be quite interesting to hear what they have to say about it. 
so that's 22nd of May. Uh, as far as observing is concerned, our next solar observing occasion will be on May the 4th, Luke Skywalker Day. And uh, again, 10 till noon on the uh, telescope. And uh, Sean, in the usual way, will be giving the go or no go for that event. Other observing uh, the week before is, uh, well, actually next week, first clear night, uh, will be our dark sky star party at Long Sioux Conservation Area. Uh, and the following week, uh, first clear night uh, between the 6th and 9th at Bayview Village Park, we'll have our city star party. And again, go or no go announcements for each of the days will be made um, uh, as necessary. And again, it's the first clear night of each of those weeks. Uh, outreach, we're starting to ramp up on our activities all over the GTA. Uh, out in Pickering, we have the Millennium Square uh, second stargazing uh, event scheduled for this year. So it's Friday the 10th of May uh, between 6 and 11 p.m. And again, a go or no go from Arnold or one of the others uh, in the organizing committee. Uh, when do you think you'll be able to do the announcement, Arnold? Uh, okay. Okay, so. Right. Okay, so the go, no go will be posted about noon hour uh, on the day in question. And the usual backup is the Saturday following, right? Yeah. Okay. So if it's uh, cloudy on the 10th, we'll hope for the 11th. Uh, International Astronomy Week is that week, and it culminates with uh, International Astronomy Day on the 11th. And uh, this is going to be a busy day, because not only w uh, would it be possible that Pick uh, Millennium Square is going in Pickering, but also we're going to be busy here at the Science Center. Uh, from 10 until noon, we'll be doing solar observing out on the patio. Again, Sean will make the go or no-go call on that, uh, as well. The Science Center has asked us to organize a telescope workshop between approximately 2 and 4 in the afternoon, which is going to be a, uh, an occasion for people to bring their telescopes in to learn how to use them, troubleshoot them, etc. And I guess we have a room that will be set aside somewhere in the, uh, the front of the building for that particular occasion. And then in the evening, I believe there's going to be uh, some stargazing uh, that's scheduled as well. Uh, it's been circulated on the Science Center's members' uh, uh, email uh, service, and it's on the uh, Science Center's uh, website. So uh, we could be busy that day, so we'll need a lot of people to help out on that occasion. Uh, another thing that's starting to ramp up, um, on May the 4th we have the... Uh, uh, that weekend is the uh, uh, spring work party for the uh, Carr Astronomical Observatory to uh, get it ready for the uh, summer observing season. Uh, the road is still closed. Uh, one of our members went on a reconnoitering trip uh, in the last few days. The road still has about, uh, you know, in spots a meter of snow still on the road. and. Uh, uh, it didn't help that there was a dump of snow uh, a couple of weeks back. Another 10 centimeters came down on it. So um, it's going to be interesting to see whether that road actually is open for the work party. Uh, we simply don't know. Uh, I'm interested because I'm supervising on the 11th <laughs> on that weekend. I want to know whether I'm going to have to park at the top or clo uh, you know, call it off or whatever. Um, but uh, winter seems to be holding on up there, something about Game of Thrones or something. But uh, at least at this point, uh, we have to continue using the winter access uh, with the parking permits for the top of the hill. So just watch out for that. We'll try to get something onto the forum as well as the website once we know the road is open. Uh, one of the membership benefits for those of you who are here for the first time is that as a member, you can try something new with uh, uh, borrowing one of our uh, uh, instruments that are in the telescope loan program. And uh, we have a number of instruments. You can see them listed on our website. And uh, you can borrow them for free for a couple of weeks at a time. And just contact the managers through the website to do that. 
And finally, there's the meeting after the meeting over at the Granite in our usual spot uh, over at Eglinton and Mount Pleasant. And with that, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, remember, there's the book signing. There are lots of books out there uh, in the lobby. Uh, take a look before you leave, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Good night, everybody. Thank you.